Welcome to the Leaders of Tomorrow show at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. In the past two weeks, we have released shows with investment titan Doug Casey, Silver Bull Chris Duane, and self-made multimillionaire Rick Rule all of whom been right about the price of gold. Silver, on the other hand, has tricked most investors. So far, it has not performed very well. It may, in fact, indeed, then be the perfect time to invest in silver. Our guest today is Mr. Frank Walker of the Silver Report Uncut. Frank is with us to explore all of this price-wise and what might be happening behind the scenes. To talk to us about his perspectives on what's going on with the price of silver Silver and where we are headed. Frank, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm doing pretty good. How about yourself? Just fantastic. And we are all lovers of silver here. So it's great to have you here to talk all about it. Let's start off with the reasons why this is happening. Silver is really continuing to underperform in comparison to other precious metals. What is your explanation for this because it's been going on for years and everyone's predictions are always that the price is just about to take off and then it doesn't. So what's really happening behind the scenes? Well, the main difference is, you know, fundamentally it's the buyer. There's a couple of different factors at play. Number one, these markets have no price discovery. These are not reflective of the actual physical, you know, demand for gold or silver. But really the big factor that has led gold to such a tremendous performance in 2019, it happens to be the type of buyer. We do know that central bank gold buying was at a record high, at least since we left the dollar's convert convertibility to gold uh, in the 70s. So central banks, they have already begun moving into gold. This began last year, but demand is very, very strong this year. And also, not just the central banks, but also the, the smart money is the way I'll term it. While the retail investors may not be awakened to the problems with their economy, and they put an enormous amount of effort into making sure that nobody really understands our economy for this reason. So they think, you know, we look at the recent surveys, they show consumer confidence is at all-time highs. And, you know, I, I believe only half of what I see, but nevertheless... Um, this means that people are still pretty much asleep, but the banks aren't, the wealthy aren't, the rich and elite aren't. I know concerning silver, JP Morgan certainly is not sleeping. They've amassed the, the greatest hoard of physical silver. These people are not doing this because they're naive or because it's a barbarous relic or it has no significance. They're doing this because they understand how much stimulus it's going to require to be able to try to keep this thing afloat. I want to point right now to what happened to China, just for example. and um, they had an enormous stimulus package, enormous. And don't worry, everybody, they're going to come out and they're going to prop up these markets. And, you know, the, the day that they open, it just swallowed it right up. And it just shows you, it screams how much stimulus is going to be required this time around. So people have not awoken to that yet. The central banks, the wealthy, the elite, they have. That's the reason why gold had such strong performance in 2009. But make no mistake. For the common man, the average man, and if you look at those surveys as well, it shows that the majority of us were not rich. Some people have a hard time swallowing paying $1,500, well, by that time, who knows, $1,600, $1,700, $1,800 an ounce for a single gold coin. People have a hard time doing that. They can't justify it in their mind. But something that is bobbling around right now, uh, nearly 17 an ounce, but you know, pushing up even to 20, it's still justifiable. When the common man moves in to protect himself from the inflation that we're already beginning to see, even on the official metrics, then they're going to move in to where they can go. They're going to move into silver. Um, so that's really what it boils down to is the type of investors. And the thing that's going to be the catalyst is number one is the money printing. The money printing has already begun. We don't have to debate about if they're going to do it, how much they're going to do. It has already begun. They're printing money at a very, very fast pace. And the issue being is that in 2011, the response in the precious metals market, the genuine response and the energy that came out from the investing public, it was as a result of the quantitative easing. People were realizing what they were doing and that the first QE1 didn't work. QE2 didn't work. QE3, they all had declining 
efficacy. And so the result was that people, they wanted to protect their money from what they thought was going to be a rush of inflation. Now, we do see that that has backed off for now in the official inflation gauge. But once the people begin to realize what these central banks are doing and that it's not really working the same way that it used to, for example, just what the Fed has added to their balance sheet during this repo issue, it's been the size, it's been greater than the size of QE1, than the initial action. So this is just during, you know, a market readjustment is what Powell is calling this. So what we see moving forward is a, is a great, great opportunity for silver. And what we really need is for the people to begin to start waking up. And, you know, once we start getting, because it's not necessarily the stock market crash. And what I want to caution people about is when the crash comes, don't, do not be surprised if silver and gold come down with it. And they may come down a significant portion and it may get a lot of people concerned. Do not be surprised. This is normal because it's not necessarily the stock market crash or an economic crash that makes people buy silver. It's what the Federal Reserve is doing with the U.S. dollar. Now, the same actions they were performing before that gave silver and gold that tremendous energy that they did need to suppress. And they're doing it again. And so as soon as and, you know, he's very, very careful with his words. This is not to be confused with the large scale asset purchases of the past. This is definitely not a QE. And honestly, the Wall Street consensus is this is a QE and the end result will be some energy in precious metals. So yes, it is, I still think, a wonderful time to buy. Absolutely. It seems to be an incredible time for silver. Turning now to the topic of price manipulation within mm -hmm. the world of precious metals, have you ever actually witnessed price manipulation in silver on the COMEX trading? It happens all the time. You know, the, the interesting thing you say about this is that they're beginning to address this, it seems. Now, I don't believe the effort is a full effort yet, but we do see that they just recently brought in, you know, JP Morgan and Chase under RICO charges, which would be racketeering, and they're going out and they have an organized effort to manipulate the price of silver, and they were found guilty. So this isn't just you know, a rumor. This is really happening. The large banks have been very involved with it. What I think they're doing now and the reason that we're only hearing about it now, because this has been around in our circle for a long time. We know. We know. We've seen, you know, how quickly things can change. But just these revelations that we are seeing it confirmed that these big banks have been manipulating the price of silver and that now we have the, them coming out and saying the regulators from the U.S. saying that they're going to put an end to it. They're going to make an example of it. Now, I don't believe any of that. I don't believe that they're really going to, um, you know, touch in uh, too deep, not where it really matters. But it's, it's good that this conversation has begun because it's constant. In fact, the entire COMEX market is a giant manipulation. Every year, if you look at like things like the Silver Institute survey, which measures the silver supply, it takes in not just what is mined, but also recycled silver, which if the prices are rising right now, you are seeing some of that activity going on, which is, you know, people cashing in their gold or silver just to take advantage of the price. So they measure all of that. And what they find with all of the silver combined, we run a deficit every year. And we have for, I think it's 10 years. Um, I have to go back and check the exact amount of time once we crossed over into this. So there is literally not enough physical silver. And yet on the COMEX market, you have hundreds of millions of tons that just don't even exist. And ultimately, it's a, it's, a, it's a game. It's a game. And they use this to get people concerned. And actually, there's documentation about the gold futures, which is where they began back in the 60s when they wanted to start, you know, getting this going. And the reason was to cause people to have doubt about the stability of the gold price. They wanted to be an agent of you know, fear. To, yes, agent of fear in the gold market. So the entire reason it was created was to to change the hearts and minds of the people because it used to be money. We used to walk around in this country and have gold coins, silver coins. They were our money, and it, people loved that. Whenever they wanted to go switch this over, people were not all turning in their gold; they were holding on to it. So they needed to start working on the hearts and the minds, changing people's perception of gold and silver. And somehow they did a wonderful job convincing people it's super volatile, but I don't think that 
Maybe you watch the FX trading markets. If you watch the way the dollar trades on a daily basis, I think if people understood that there are markets right now where people are buying and selling stocks that we call currencies. So the dollar is one of those stocks. Right now, the FX markets are getting demolished for emerging markets, so everyone is buying the dollar. So what those buyers do with their money matters for the value of the US dollar. This is very, very alarming. Honestly, it's because the dollar has no true value, only faith. Now, what happens if these investors change their minds or they start getting some bigger returns on, say, the euro or maybe any other kind of currency? The, the stage we're at now, though, is that we are making the world upset. We're making the world upset with our policy and the way we utilize our economic restrictions on different countries. They don't like it. And we do have that control. We rule the world with the dollar. Now, if enough of these countries, these investors get together and decide they no longer favor the dollar or just out of principle, they're not going to hold the dollar because some people get those kind of ideas sometimes whenever they have their economy falling apart. But then they could all gang up and we can see an issue where the dollar could drop in value in a heartbeat is the, the short point of that is that what holds it together right now is nothing more than hope then hope. Gold and silver is solid, is tangible, is in your money, is in your pocket. It's, it gains. I mean, if we look at the price of gold, that's not what we really need to, you know, examine because the price of gold is only reflective of pretty much the collapse of the U.S. dollar. And it goes in proportion. We have these huge gap ups, like, you know, gaps up like we did uh, in the mid 2000s. And we've kind of just been floating up here near these all-time highs in gold price. And people act like $1,000 an ounce of gold when we drop down is a bad gold price. You have to understand this stuff was $35 an ounce going back, you know, 40, 50 years ago. So this has gone just about parabolic as it is. And it's just a steady stream. When in doubt, zoom out. When you look at the long-term history of gold price, silver price, Honestly, we used to have, you know, our pocket change was silver. So you talk about the silver dollar is now probably going for $20. And is it exactly equal with inflation? No, actually, inflation adjusted, silver is just absolutely, uh, you know, it's just unbelievable that it could be this low. Yeah. It is the lowest in history inflation adjusted. We've never actually seen silver this low and it looks like it's high because of the price, you know, um, in dollar terms is high. But what that really is, is the fact that those dollars, they don't go as far. The money printing has an effect. And so what you're really watching is not the rise in the price of silver and gold because what I view silver and gold as being extremely stable. Yes, there are times of volatility, but we don't want that. You don't want silver that's going to jump up $10 a day. You might think you do, but these kinds of moves that quickly, they're not normally sustainable. And, you know, we have been climbing. Silver has been advancing. All we need at this point, as you can tell, is a strong wind. And it will come in and radically change the consensus of the populace. I think that, you know, as we've seen recently, the wrong string of headlines, even though it seems like the Dow is invincible, it seems that way. These policies, there's a limit to what they can do. We look at, you know, Japan, the perfect example. They've pretty much have just faded away into irrelevancy on the world stage. And this was formerly the number two most powerful economy in the world. Everything was made in Japan back in the 80s and into the 90s. And they have just never recovered since their stock market crash. I mean, they almost brought the world markets down. They were pretty much the pioneers that, that were spearheading this quantitative easing movement. Then in 2008, everyone is doing it now. You need to understand, this was only an idea and it was a bad one. It was such a bad idea that it was never implemented the entire history in the United States of central banking. And they didn't really actually think it could work. When you even look at some of the comments from Jerome Powell, they explain just the finality of entering into these policies that we can't back out, that the market will not allow the Fed to back out, and that the Fed has now become dependent on what the market says. You look at the market implied 
rate cut odds, they're very, very accurate. They tell you where interest rates are going and people don't understand why they know is because the market is just telling the Federal Reserve, you are going to cut interest rates. And we see that very clearly. And this means that the Fed is now the sole strength of this market. That's a very, very bad sign because like I said, we are seeing these policies are losing their efficacy. The amount that they've printed recently, it's enormous. And yet we're still seeing wobbles here in the U.S. Right. And um, the repo market has just taken over. And most people mm -hmm. don't even realize that this is happening. And we are having mm -hmm. billions and billions of dollars printed. And the impact on the value of our money is just devastating. Now, um, there is a term known as snowflakes referring to people that seem to become overly emotional or react very easily or become insulted or insult people or become violent whenever ideas that differ from their own are expressed. These seem to be the very type of people that are not prepared in case something should happen economically. What are your thoughts on how crazy things might get in the mm. event of an economic turndown. I'm really concerned about how bad things are already getting. I mean, we, we look at, we're seeing a serious social breakdown in many major cities around the United States. And we actually cover this a lot. We travel around and just look at some of the urban decay that is going on in the Northeast of the United States and it's immense. And uh, you know, people might act like it's not happening. So you talk about what will happen if the economy crashes. Now, up. They shut down the stores, you know, this whole event going on over there. They shut down the stores. Within two days, they were getting in fistfights in the grocery stores. The stores were, were empty. And, you know, that was only two days. And most cities only have around three days worth of food on hand. Ultimately, you know, and the path we're going down, I just don't know. You see, that, that's where it rubs me the wrong way with these people who come and just parrot the, the administration because j just because – they want to wash away some of the bad things about our economy just because it hurts the cause. But like I said, we need to be honest. We need to be honest about what's going on because a lot of Americans right now, they are living paycheck to paycheck, what we see in the surveys. And more than that, it's not enough because there, you see the debt in the 80s, debt, personal consumer debt was just about unheard of when you compare it to what we're seeing today. So we do know things have changed and the living standards have changed. It's just the human mind has an amazing capability to just adapt and to accept its surroundings. So we don't get mad, but we got to look up and realize, you know, it's already crumbling. There's a lot of things. There's a lot of plants and manufacturers that are still closing. It wasn't a thing in the past that we talk about and examine and see how to fix. It's still happening. Manufacturers are closing left and right in the U.S., not because of any kind of, you know, outside event. It's happening now because profits in U.S. corporations have been declining since 2014. So we need more than the stock market. I do admit some of the changes in trade are better than what we had. But these things take time. We can't pretend like those changes are already in effect now. We need a real recovery. We don't need to just say it's recovered. Bam. We need a real recovery. I think there's been enormous strides towards that end that we've seen recently. But it, I, I really believe it's too little, too late. The volume of, of our debt is this nation, the amount that they're printing, literally, we're going to need to do something about the dollar, and it's going to be soon. We have, you know, the president who says that the dollar is valued too high, and, and that's a problem for the manufacturers, and that's true. That's also true. So their goal is to devalue the dollar even further. That's why they say there's no inflation. That's the entire reason they say there's no inflation. Well, there's actually more than that, so they don't have to increase the Social Security either. So they have an enormous interest to cover up some of the things that are going on in our economy. And all you ever hear about is the same three data points, like the unemployment. People don't realize the unemployment rate troughs before every recession. A trough is the low point. It bottoms. So any uptick in the unemployment at this point, that means that we've probably already begun to see the downfall. 
And it has. I mean, it's, it's low. That's not uncommon. It's not uncommon for the market to break out to new highs within three months of these huge, dramatic stock market events. Nothing right now that is going on in the economy would suggest that a recession is not imminent. There's nothing that would suggest that. There's no evidence. Mm -hmm. Now, there's hope. There's green shoots. There's things that maybe could look positive. But right now, it's amazing how confident the consumer is because we look at quarter four spending for the holiday. It was, it was, it was definitely lacking the energy, especially of November. So shopping in December was lower. We have durable goods, new orders. It's, it's dropping. We have an issue right now. So the consumer is confident, but they're not spending. They're not spending. And they show you the statistics they show you, like the year over year rise in retail sales. They forget last year in December, retail sales came in with a drop of 1.2%. It was huge. Everybody was like, this can't be real. So when they show you the rise this year and try to tell you how great it is, we really need to look a little bit deeper because. I mean, it's already, the evidence is already around us of the decay, of the decline. And the social changes that we're seeing right now, this is really the evidence. Because that's the kind of thing you begin to see in tough economic times. We see the, for the, the birth rate is way down. We see, you know, home ownership is down. A lot of key metrics that would suggest would be rising in an expanding economy. And they're, they're not expanding. None of the data points are suggestive that this is currently an expansion. Right. And, yes. And, well, you mentioned something. You hit on a very good point in that um, the president basically has had to go in mm -hmm. and renegotiate every trade deal that we've had with everyone all over the planet because we have had decades of just really bad business ship. He's a businessman, thank God, but the strain and the result of what has basically ended up giving all of our money away to other countries for so long has put us in a situation that's very scary. And um, since he's gone in and done this, do you think what is happening is it's too soon to say okay, I've renegotiated everything, I've fixed everything, we're fine. So what you're saying is this is going to take time, the results mm. of what he's done. Um, talk to us a little bit about the timing that you see, because it's a really excellent point, because after so many years of all of our money being given away, we have watched our cities, just Detroit and Chicago and the Northeast mm. and everything Boy. we're talking about just fall apart. In the past three years, He's done an excellent job renegotiating, but how long do you think the effect is going to take? All right. Um, I think, you know, let me just touch on one subject for a second. They, yeah. they got them to agree to a raise of the average wage for auto workers in Mexico to $16 an hour. What a great victory. I just, I mean, because honestly, that could do so much and they had the requirement of the increase of percentage of auto parts that need to be produced on this continent. So those two things alone, I think, are just monumental. As far as timing, we don't even have people trained to manufacture the way they do right now. That knowledge, that wisdom. See, this is the most damaging part about this great sucking sound we've seen since they sent, you know, pretty much our factories overseas is the fact that the knowledge, the wealth is slipping away. Those people, they're no longer, most of them, a lot of them, not in the workplace anymore. So those skills weren't handed down. It's going to take time to train people to be able to produce things again. It is of utmost importance because there was trade-offs. There was a trade-off. We didn't get nothing for the deal. What we got was a strong dollar. It's called the strong dollar policy. And therefore, we could buy the world's junk-made goods for really, really cheap. But there comes a point where this kind of a policy reaches its end as well because eventually you don't have any money to spend. If you're not producing anything, if you don't have any quality jobs, if the jobs you have are only either working for the government, working for healthcare, everybody can't be a nurse, honestly. So if the quality of the jobs that we have here, it just, it's going to take a complete and total 
change. We have moved away from production. We have moved away from manufacturing. Nobody even would even consider a lot of that hard work these days. In fact, there's a place where I live, they're a manufacturer and they're hiring and they can't keep guys on because the guys they get on, they, they, they uh, actually have to work. They actually mm-hmm. have to work. So mm-hmm. another issue we have is not just, it's the skilled labor. It's the ability to, to get back to work, to get this going again. And those kinds of things take time, possibly a generation to be able to, to resurface that. So there's great strides that were made. I, really the heart of it is about what the Fed is doing with the dollar. What the heart of it is, is that we are having depression-like symptoms on our economy while seeing inflation on the official inflation gauges. The official inflation gauges are so underreported, it's insane. Like Talk I said earlier- Talk to us about this. Talk to, Shadow, go into this in depth. No, I was just looking at this uh, chart earlier from Shadow Stats, and it showed uh, a graph visually of the inflation rate that if we would use the calculations from the 90s, if we would use it from the 80s. So they made some big changes in the 80s to the way we calculate inflation. There's a problem. There's Social Security, which doesn't have the funds. We now currently, well, they had a stockpile of treasuries, but they're selling them to pay off Social Security payments because we've now dropped below the amount of population increase in order to be able to sustain those Social Security payments. So it's a big hole. It's a big gaping hole. And the way, and if they were to report the real inflation, imagine how much they would need to adjust those payments going out. They can't have the payments adjusted to real inflation. So beginning in the 80s, they made some major changes in the way they calculate this. Then moving into the 90s, they had to do it again because it wasn't enough. And if we use the same gauge we used in the 90s to measure inflation, we're running around 10% right now. We look at some costs like healthcare. That's the big one. Healthcare is really just crushing a lot of families. And, and some people might not notice this, but if you're middle class, you're the one who loses right now. If you're middle class, you're the one, if you get sick, God forbid, get cancer, you're going to have some serious problems keeping up with those bills because they don't take it easy on people who produce in this nation. So those policies themselves are just, <laughs> it's just eating us alive. Ultimately, so they say there's no inflation to protect themselves, but everybody knows inflation is high. Everybody knows, and the one other major difference with the inflation calculations, it would happen to be oil price. You see oil, it was up running $150 a barrel back uh, during the Great Recession. Uh, now we're looking at oil price, which has completely fallen through the floor. Um, this is helping to pull down CPI, but they also don't calculate it when you see big swings. With the housing prices, if we see big swings in the price, they don't calculate it on the inflation gauge because it would throw off the metrics. So they just completely void the information. If there's a huge jump in rents, huge jump in prices, they just avoid the information entirely because they would believe it's not a great representation of the flow of the inflation calculation. So it's really a joke. It's designed to be underreported. And the central banks, they're the ones complaining that we don't have enough inflation. I just saw this article where they were explaining that, you know, they need to run inflation much hotter, that inflation is just too low. And their perception, you understand what inflation really is? Let's get down to the raw definition. It's them devaluing the currency by 2% every year. It's making the dollar worth 2% less every year. And if they feel like it's not enough, they want to increase it to 4%. They want to increase it to 4%. But the way we're going now, honestly, we're going to lose control of that decision-making power about where we want inflation to go. So we have depression-like symptoms. We have inflationary things happening. This shouldn't happen. This is a very strange phenomenon referred to as an inflationary depression. In the Great Depression, it was very deflationary, very heavy. And if you look at deflation historically, it used to go down. We used to have deflation every time we had a recession. In the Great Recession, it was very, very minute. It was that how bad it was. But besides that, we don't have deflation anymore. All we have now is inflation. We don't drop down. Prices don't really have deflation. And you know what? They've told us the story of the past 10 years is a story of deflation. And that, it's just impossible. It's not true. Right, right. You know, um, 
I've, I've spoken with many people that discuss, you know, the great depressions that took place. And one of them mm-hmm. was Wayne Jett. He, he has an incredible um, book out um, about this specifically. And it's really interesting because he talked about that during the Depression, that um, it was manipulated so that people with money could go in and buy things on the penny pennies on the dollar, because there was such a rapid deflation during Mm -hmm. that depression. Everything became so inexpensive. And what we have right now is very interesting because it's a depression. It's inflationary depression. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, it's a whole new animal here. If you have a depression and then prices start to rise instead of going down like it did mm-hmm. before. We've got a really bad situation, Frank. This is only made possible by the central bank's inflationary actions. That's exactly what they are. It's only made possible. It's, this phenomenon shouldn't even be able to exist in a normal functioning economy. It just shows that nothing is normal about this economy, and we do really need a real recovery. I think, like I said, there's steps that are being made. But it, it takes time. And to say that it's already come and this was already the grand, grand hurrah. And right now we have the greatest economy we've ever seen. Honestly, I think we need a little bit more than that. We need this thing to be running the way it used to be. We need to get these buildings opened up. We need to get these people working. And honestly, and if, if the economy was in a real expansion, the corporate profits would be rising. People would be you know, we wouldn't have the drop in the birth rate. We wouldn't have a lot of these things going on. We would have healing, have healing. And I think the central bank has prolonged what is now the greatest depression that we're in. The central bank has prolonged this by their actions, because if we would have just let those banks fail, those companies fail, new ones would come. New ones would come and they would operate correctly. Why is it that the banks that be in 2008 must remain the top financial institutions in the world? Why are they preserved and kept and funded and made sure nothing happens to them? And plenty of banks failed. Plenty of banks failed, but just these top banks. And I feel like how un-American to provide support for these banks and keep these. It's, it's essentially an unfair advantage using policy to benefit corporations. and. We lose in all of this. That's why we need a real recovery because the central banks, you know, fruit that they hand out to us, they don't reach us all. They don't reach us all. The impacts of inflation do reach us all, however. And by the time that that money gets down to us after the whole process of the banks holding it and switching it and switching hands, it's lost. It's purchasing power. So at the time it was created, they benefit the greatest. The Fed the banks themselves. And so that's why we need, we need freedom from the Fed, honestly. We need to end the Fed or at least start the conversation about what we do about the Fed. Yeah, that's an incredibly important point that in mm-hmm. 2008, under President Obama, the very banks that lost all of our money, stole, became very rich while losing our money. Absolutely. Um, and then proclaimed themselves to be bankrupt, Mm -hmm. that our government, under the leadership of our president, instead of um, buying out or paying off all of the mortgages, because the banks lost all that money, and so, and then everybody, and they did the the housing scenario where everybody refinanced, and it was a Mm -hmm. big, um, terrible situation where they refinanced into incredibly high interest rates. So everybody was about to lose all of their homes and it was a whole fear mongering situation. But instead of paying off the homes for the American people, they bailed out, they gave all the money to the very banks that lost all the money and then they lost it again. Now these banks are in trouble again. And I hate the term lost, Frank. I hate, I hate the term lost. When a bank says to me, I've lost a billion or a trillion dollars. Now I need a billion or a trillion more dollars Mm -hmm. from you, the taxpayer. I look at them and say, I want an audit. I want to know where all of that money went. And there's nothing like that that's ever happened. 
No, an audit is equivalent to ending the Fed. Looking at what they have going on on those books is the equivalent, at least, they can't audit it. They can't audit I mean, that's, what, that's, that's the Fed's position. It can't be done. It can't be done because, honestly, they, we, they, we question them sometimes. Sometimes they got to come and testify before the people's representatives, and we question them, and their answers are, we don't need to tell you. We're independent. In fact, there's going to be people in the comments who are going to explain to you why the independence of the Fed is so important, why it's so necessary. And that is just the Fed's own writing. They push that narrative out because they want us to feel like no one should be in charge of this institution. They're not federal. There's no reserve. They're a private bank and they're paying themselves. They're paying themselves because they used to give to the Treasury more money. They used to give the Treasury more money, but now they've been giving less. And that's interesting because the way they're doing it is they're paying out the bank's interest on their excess reserves. Now, people don't realize the Federal Reserve is just a conglomerate of some of the most powerful banks in the world. So they're paying themselves interest on this money so that they could give less to the Treasury. Tell me, how is this allowed to go on? And nobody in the position to do anything mentions it. That's what I want to hear. That's what I want to hear coming out of these people. And I want to hear that they intend to do something about the Fed, that at least they know about what the Fed is doing. That's, that's to me, characteristic of somebody I can trust. Yeah, we really need the return of integrity, trustworthiness, mm -hmm. transparency, openness, the ability to say, where is our money? Show us our money. If you mm -hmm. lost our money, show us the paper trail of where it went at least. If it's lost and gone, let's track it down mm -hmm. because someone stole our money. You and me, the American people, it's not their money. And there are so many people that lost their mm -hmm. homes in that tragedy. And The banks didn't lose their homes. No. They got a lot of them. Right. They sure did. <laughs> They sure did. I want to end now with something that um, you mentioned on one of your shows about the Chicago PMI mm -hmm. and how that is um, very important. I think that everyone should know what is happening in Chicago. And I want you to explain to us first, what is the PMI and briefly tell us what is happening. Okay, so the PMI stands for Purchasing Managers Index, and it's conducted by the Fed, the Chicago PMI. It's conducted by the regional uh, Chicago branch of the Federal Reserve. They do a survey of businesses in the manufacturing sector, and they ask them a number of different questions. The PMI would just be the results of those surveys. What it's showing, for example, we see in Philadelphia, they happen to have a good PMI. It came in a little bit, even beat expectations. Chicago, however, has had contractions for seven months in a row. In fact, the last time I checked, there's currently 277 people moving out of Illinois every day. There's a huge exodus of people out of the state. And Chicago, is this going to get bad? Chicago is the land of million dollar pensions. I know I said that on my program, but people don't understand how much the state has obliged itself in this particular area. And these pensions, there's obligations and the people, they're running. They want to raise the taxes to fix some of the problems, to make up for the people who left. But it just leads to more and more people leaving. So the Chicago PMI, it hasn't done that seven months of contraction, the length of contraction since the financial crisis. So the data they're putting out right now is recession level data. Not one coming in the future or when will it come. In Chicago right now, their manufacturing sector has been in a recession for, I mean, two or more months of a contraction would be a technical recession. The number that just came out was 42.9. A number of 50 denotes expansion. So they're not only declining, but it's getting worse. It's getting worse in Chicago. And it has a lot to do with people leaving. They're not the only one in this story. You see the same thing in New York, California even. Cali California has had amazing population growth. And that trend looks like it's reversing. And it began in 2019. So these problems, you know, that's – how do you think Detroit got that way? You know, how do you think it ends up that way? And Chicago is just 
right next door. And it's the same exact situation, except for instead of being the fifth biggest city of the United States, completely cutting in half, it's going to be the third. Chicago is significant regionally. It's just a beacon for its entire area. It, it's the linchpin that holds everything together there. And if Chicago is hurting, just wait until we see what's going to be going on in the surrounding regions. There's so much that literally depends on that income, including the Illinois representatives. Yes. <laughs> now, Frank, what do you see as the cure for everything we've talked about here? I mean, we've talked about the precious metals mm -hmm. price and um, the people that are vacating the large cities and the dilapidated conditions that we have in the Northeast and the Federal Reserve. Um, talk to us about what you see as the overall solution here, besides the president's renegotiation of our trade deals worldwide, which, as you made a very important point, it's going to take time for mm -hmm. us to really recover. And during that time, the Fed continues to print money. So will we recover? So we would need to reduce the size of the government by 40%, probably. That's, that's probably the main problem we got here. Honestly, we don't need this many people to do such a poor job. You talk about spending, they, they, people are upset. They're generally upset and they believe that we should have higher taxes. There's people out there who have been convinced that having high taxes is good. And look at how these people manage money. No matter who's there, we're running trillion dollar deficits. We've got enormous debt. That is absolutely the last people in the world that I think should have our money. So why, you know, it's like, giving money to someone who's an alcoholic or somebody who just keeps doing it again and again. Oh, I'll do it different this time. Don't worry. I'll do it different this time. It's Practice. so true, Frank, because they keep losing our money, spending our money, and they mm -hmm. walk away very, very wealthy. All right, of the politicians, all, all of the bankers, they're the wealthiest in our nation talking about, oops, we lost your money. They're obviously thieves, Frank. That would be the, that's just the start. But ultimately, we, we need to awaken people to the Federal Reserve exactly what it is and what it does. There is, was just a study I saw recently. It showed it was 90% of Americans didn't know what the Federal Reserve does. Or, you know, and I'm sitting there, I don't know who you asked that, but I, I kind of believe it. A lot of people don't realize that this is a private bank. This is a foreign private bank that moved here and they attempted it one time and the president of the United States at the time, Thomas Jefferson, he dissolved that bank. And he made a very important statement that if the people of the United States allow the issue of their money to be determined by private banks, the institutions, this is paraphrased, by the way, the institutions that will rise up around them will leave them homeless on the continent, their forebearers conquered. And this is exactly what we're seeing. And this is why I get concerned with the way that people report the economy, because if no one is addressing the Fed and they have an enormous incentive not to, if you look at the list of donors, I mean, we got to end the Fed. We got to awaken people to what it does. Why do we need a central bank to manage the issue of the people's money? Why can't the treasury do it? Why can't we use gold and silver? I know the reason why we can't right now and the reason they suppress it now, but that doesn't change the fact that it's an, a very, very stable money. It's a very, it's sound money. A lot of states are waking up to this and they're beginning to move over. Like you look at Texas, you can store your precious metals in a state-backed bullion bank. Now, keep in mind, I don't, I don't always want to give my gold to the state, but it's secured. It's secured. And a vote would need to be taken in order to enable a confiscation from there. So there's laws that are put in place that are supposed to prevent that. And you can spend it on a debit card. These things are amazing. These kinds of things creeping across the more states that are eliminating the sales tax on precious metals that are instituting ways that we can utilize it again. And I think that that's, that's the way forward. It's kind of like a reverse Gresham's law that if people in the process of time realize that the federal reserve notes decline in value and the gold and silver that they hold in their savings is increasing in value, then over time, they will decide that it's not good to hold your money. You see, Federal Reserve notes punish savers. Gold does not. So if you're a responsible, normal, clear-headed person, gold and silver is the answer for savings. Why would you want to give it to a bank that's going to give you barely any interest when we see there was a 20% return? And stocks, on the other hand, hey, 
You know, anything, this is just crazy right now. The market's crazy. I don't, I, don't, I don't view gold and silver as being unsafe at all. It's money. You're not purchasing a product. You're exchanging one form of money for another. That's why there shouldn't be taxes. And it's not just, you know, a currency like the dollar. It is money. It's used around the entire world. There's pawn shops everywhere around you where if you needed to go and sell your gold or your silver, gold loans are very popular. If your savings were held in gold, you could borrow against it. Therefore, it's liquid pay it back without having other types of collateral. And there's tons and tons of banks that accept gold. So it's not just sitting still or barbarous. It is literally the ultimate form of savings. It would be the end of the federal debt because you look at the debt along with the devaluation of the dollar, along with the price of gold, and it shows you a very interesting dynamic is that gold and silver is the antidote. It's the answer. It's the answer to the Fed and because you can't endlessly print money. You can't endlessly take out debt if you really got to pay it. If you really have to pay it because our government doesn't pay debt. They just create more, create more. In fact, the, the, what they're doing right now in this QE, not QE, now the Federal Reserve is prevented from buying treasury debt outright. What they're doing now is buying treasury debt that is three days old. It's the same thing as buying it outright, and this would be considered helicopter money. That means that the Federal Reserve is funding the national debt. It's being, so they are directly money printing. It's called helicopter money when they do this, and people don't understand the significance of buying new debt, and that's exactly what they've begun to do now. So they're just creating debt to have access to capital. Now, in the future, that's when we're going to need to pay for this. And our country, in the meantime, is the one that suffers, not the private Fed. The private people that own the Fed are extremely wealthy from all of this. Well, That's why the Fed hates gold. Gold and silver is the money of free men and women. Right. Frank, this has covered so many important topics that people are waking up to. Please tell everyone where they can go to follow your work, your writings, and your podcasts. Uh, well, you can uh, stop by the Silver Report Uncut YouTube channel. We produce content just about every day. I try to be exciting and, <laughs> you know, stay on top of things. So uh, this is Silver Report Uncut. Yep. Great. It's good stuff. Frank, thank you so much for coming on this show today. Hey, thank you. Mr. Frank Walker host of Silver Report Uncut YouTube channel. For the leaders of tomorrow's show, I'm Michelle Holliday at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. 